Live pictures from the border in Lukeville, Arizona. As the sun goes down, the cartels will come out for another night of smuggling. What a News Nation poll says should happen to those people who come across. Good evening and welcome to the program. I'm Leland Vitter. One of the most popular apps on your phone is likely circumventing all of the Apple and Google privacy settings and sending the data back to Chinese intelligence, which app it is, and what, if anything, you can do about it tonight. Plus, the great avocado war has begun. How the famous fruit got in the middle of an international crisis that's costing you your guacamole. But first, more proof tonight Americans are uniquely compassionate and loving, even when faced with the most difficult of situations. An exclusive News Nation poll shows that despite three quarters of the country worried that illegal immigrants create an economic burden, a full 70 percent, almost the same amount, 70 percent of Americans want to give the 11 million illegal immigrants in the country a pathway to citizenship. For reference, that 11 million people is about the same number of people as in Georgia. We're going to get to the political implications of that in a minute, but as compassionate as Americans are, they are almost equally skeptical of new illegal immigrants coming across. We've shown you now for weeks videos of single adult males who crossed illegally being dropped off at airports and bus stations near the border. In this case, they're flying in on a plane from the border to other towns in America with nothing more than a piece of paper telling them to check in as their cases go through the immigration courts. No surprise, many don't show up. They are released into the United States with little more than a promise to show up for court. And two-thirds of Americans are not happy about it. Only 34% of Americans support the release of single adult males here illegally in the country. Scott Traner of Decision Desk HQ ran the poll, standing by to break down the numbers and tell us who Americans are mad at over immigration policy. But first, back to the video of people here illegally released into the country just hours or days after crossing the border. The cartels charge big bucks to bring each person crossing the border across. And they are using the promise of the videos to sell their services. And the cartel's advertising is working. Last year, the Border Patrol encountered 1.7 million people crossing illegally into the United States, a near record high, of which we understand only 55,000, roughly 5% were deported versus nearly 50% who were deported in 2020. A 95% chance of staying in America is a very good product and an appealing product, a valuable product for the cartels to sell. Robert Sherman is traveling the border from San Diego all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, and today is looking at how the cartels sell their services and make their money. Robert, good evening. Good evening to you, Leland, and it doesn't matter where we stop off on this border trip. The border remains hot when it comes to migrant crossings. Actually, News Nation was just able to acquire brand new migrant apprehension numbers from the month of January from a federal court filing. Over 153,000 migrant encounters were tallied at the southwest border this past month in January. To put that into context, that's nearly double 2021's total in the month of January, which was about 78,000, but over four times what was recorded in 2020. That was about 36,000. It is also important to note that about 78,000 of of those people uh, who were apprehended at the border were expelled under Title 42. But that brings us to the issue of what happens to those who have been detained. And there's been big debate over that, and there's been a uh, big changing uh, from that from the Biden administration. So there are about 21,000 or so, give or take on a day-to-day -day basis, people who are in, migrants who are in federal detention facilities on a day-to-day -day basis. In 2020, before the Biden administration came in, that number was about 19,000. But now you're starting to see more alternative detention facilities come into play. Uh, having migrants stay uh, in, um, uh, that would be a home arrest, you know, of staying in uh, places of residence. You have about 164,000 that are under those alternative strategies uh, and other kind of facilities such as that. We know that some Democrats are not in favor of this policy because they view it as profiting off of uh, the detention process uh, with some of these private facilities. Law enforcement, going back to your point earlier, says it misses the point. You need to stop the surge of people who are coming in, and you do that by getting rid of catch and release. Listen to this. 
you have to stop releasing people. Once you stop releasing people, the cartels can't advertise their products. Um, they can't convince people to, to give them thousands of dollars just to be sent back to their home country. These people are willing to give the cartels thousands of dollars because they know that they're going to be released into the United States. So the messaging being, if people feel as though that they won't be expelled from the country, why not take a shot at coming over to the United States? And the new numbers from the month of January, Leland, 62,573 migrants released into the United States this past month. Leland? Yeah, and always we have to put an asterisk next to these numbers because these are the people that we know about that were actually encountered by Border right. Patrol. It doesn't count all the people uh, who got away or who we don't even know crossed uh, and were smuggled across. Robert, we'll check in with you tomorrow. Keep up the great work. Thank you. With that, we bring in Scott Tranter of Decision Desk HQ, News Nation polling partner. Hey, Scott, um, boy, I was stunned that 70% of Americans say, let's have a pathway to citizenship. Yeah, no, I, I, I was surprised too. It has been trending that way. The News Nation poll is on the higher end of the spectrum. There's been some public polling over the last couple of years where it's been certainly trending higher than 50%, sometimes in the 60s. But given that the border and immigration has been, you know, a hot button issue in basically every election since 2004, um, this is certainly, you know, a high watermark um, across the board for people who wanting, you know, path to citizenship for illegal immigrants. You think about 70 percent of voters want a pathway to citizenship, and yet politically it seems like an absolute impossibility that it's going to get done. Is that because that other 30% is such a powerful minority? Yeah, well, powerful, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the, uh, gets the attention. And I think the, the, border, the border advocates on closing it down and stopping, um, you know, no pathway to citizenship are certainly louder in Congress. Um, you know, 70 percent, you know, if you get 70 percent of the vote in the Senate, you're supposed to be able to pass something. If you get 70 percent of the vote in the House, you're supposed to be able to pass something. Well, 70 percent of the vote um, in the so House on paper, or it looks. Yeah, 70 percent of the vote in the House yeah. or the Senate, you can pass it even without the president's signature. That's veto override. Exactly. Uh, area. Yeah. Uh, pathway yeah. to citizenship, 72 percent of women support, 67 percent of men support. You probably you'd almost think there'd be a, a larger gender gap. But is that really that significant? Statistically speaking, it's not significant. Um, in fact, I think I'm a little bit more surprised it's that close. Generally speaking, we see that, you know, 10 to 12 points. And so the fact that it's statistically rough, basically statistically the same, shows that this is no longer, a, you know, this is no longer an issue divided by gender. Now, and obviously, if you've got 70% of Americans saying this, there's at least a good percentage of Republican yeah. voters who, who agree with that. Uh, this one... I thought it was interesting. Wall effective in preventing illegal immigration. 51% yes, 49% no. But Hispanics split exactly the same, 50-50. Uh, you, you would think that, that the demographics on this would be different. What do you attribute that to? I attribute it to it's a, it's a common sense type thing in the, in the sense that, I don't know, there's 100-foot walls, you know, C to C is a thing, but people understand, given that it's been an issue for the last 10 or 15 years, a little bit more nuanced than it, and understand that, yeah, walls in certain areas seem to work, walls in other areas seem not to work, and so we should, you know, we should be pro for them. What's interesting when you compound it with the previous stat, if 70% think illegal immigrants should have a path to citizenship, there's a good chunk of those who also think walls work. So again, these things, these, these issues, people are getting a lot more nuanced on it, and they're holding multiple positions. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, two things can be true at once. What do you make of yep. this split, right? 70% say pathway to citizenship for those here, but almost the same 66% say we should not be releasing the people who come across the border into the United States. Well, that's another example of just the American elector and the American people being able to hold a nuanced opinion on this, right? It seems to make sense that if you're here illegally, we're not going to be able to deport you. So we need a pathway to citizenship. We need to figure out whether it's some sort of fine, whether it's some sort of work release, some sort of process, because we're just not going to round you up and deport you. But on the same end, if you don't have a good reason to be here, or you may have committed a crime or something like that. We, we, we should be able to uh, we shouldn't be able to just release you to the wild. It's an example of the electorate being able to hold a nuanced opinion. Nuanced opinion. Uh, unfortunately, at the ballot box, you have to vote one way or the other. Does this poll suggest that immigration is a driving factor 
for voters, and if so, to which direction? So if we had read this poll, maybe say in 2016 or 2012, um, I would have said certainly, but immigration is, is maybe a top five, top six issue. It's no longer top three as it used to be a, a few cycles ago. So I'm not sh quite sure it's a driving issue yet. If we see immigration as, as you know, a number one issue, like say inflation is um, or something like that, or COVID is, then yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Um, but usually Congress is a lagging indicator. You know, they follow the polling. They don't make the polling. Now, that's a great point. Also, as you point out, the anti-citizenship build a wall crowd is a lot more vocal than the other side in terms of driving uh, voters. Scott, interesting as always. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, talking about election cycles, forget relitigating the 2020 election. We're going to have to go back to the 2016 election for this one in the Trump-Russia collusion accusations, investigations, and general mess. Stay with us because this is as confusing as it is important. Special counsel John Durham filed papers Friday that accuse a lawyer for Hillary Clinton's campaign of lying about his loyalties to the FBI. Ordinarily, this wouldn't mean much, except he is accused of lying while discussing data about internet traffic at Trump Tower that allegedly showed a link between the Trump Organization and the Kremlin. Durham is looking into the origins of the FBI investigation into then-candidate, then-President Trump, and the Russian collusion accusations. As discussed, it's confusing, but that doesn't keep our competitors from wildly spinning what is important and serious news. For the facts, as dry as they are, Clinton lawyer that we're discussing is Michael Sussman. Durham alleges Sussman shared internet data with the CIA that purported to show that Trump and or his associates were using rare Russian-made cell phones near the White House and other locations in his filing. And this is perhaps the most explosive part. Durham says he will prove the most explosive allegation in court that the data was gathered, quote, for the purpose of gathering derogatory information about Donald Trump. When things get this confusing, there is one man we can count on for a nonpartisan sense of things, Robert Driscoll, former deputy assistant attorney general, now in private practice. Um, all right, is this a smoking gun or just smoke? It's certainly smoke. Um... I think a lot of the coverage, I think your, your setup was great. A lot of the coverage has been a little bit overblown. You know, this isn't an instance of hacking or reading someone's emails or something like that. But what's alleged is, is pretty serious. Essentially, what, what Durham said in the filing was that consultants who uh, you know, are connected through Sussman to the Clinton campaign uh, had access to so-called DNS data, which is essentially the, the high-level Internet data about um, uh, checking domain names in what computer systems are looking for other computer systems on the web. So it's not specific communications, but taking that data, sifting through it, and looking for, quote, suspicious patterns. And then the suspicious pattern they found, or alleged to tried to pass off to the FBI and the CIA, was that there was some kind of connection initially between Alpha Bank, a Russian bank, and, uh, and servers near Trump Tower, and then also some Russian activity around the White House, which I think was actually from the Obama administration. So it's a... Uh, the, the, the real question is, you know, as Durham's already found, there wasn't really sufficient predication for a lot of these Russian in investigations that happened in retrospect. So, and so why are we how hearing about this, this now? This stuff get... Well, I mean, this, the, the basic outlines of this from the New York Times probably a few months ago. Um, it's, I think it's coming out now because it was in this particular filing having to do with the conflict of interest that Durham alleges of Sussman's counsel because he represented the law firm and Sussman uh, or is representing both at the same time or had represented both. And so in, that, in the filing, he laid out what he was going to prove at trial to kind of get into the conflict issue. And that's, I think, people focused on this issue of taking the Internet data uh, and, and sifting through it and passing it off to the FBI and the CIA. Mm. And Durham's position is that these consultants and Sussman himself were aware that this information wasn't strong enough to draw any connection between uh, Trump and Russia and pass it off anyway. Essentially, you know, the technique in Washington is called stovepiping, where you you dump something into the FBI, they say, sure, we'll look at it, and then you immediately leak to the press that your opponent is under investigation by the FBI simply because you've dumped something to the FBI for them. And so that's essentially what this is and what Durham is looking into. But it, it is not a hack, uh, in, I think, as we understand that term, and it's not spying as we understand that term. It raises some difficult privacy issues about what this consultant, who apparently was working with the White House on, on 
server security issues and working with other private contractors on security issues, what they're doing kind of making this data available um, to, to, you know, politically affiliated people to, to make contact with the government and dump it in there. I think that's concerning enough that it doesn't need to be overblown uh, to say it's a hack or it's spying, uh, because that hasn't been shown yet. I mean, mm. maybe it will be, but that's not what this is about. Uh, Hillary Clinton responded, Trump and Fox are desperately spinning up a fake scandal to distract from his real ones. So it's a day that ends in why. The more his misdeeds are exposed, the more they lie. Uh, Bob, you and I have been at this together, I think, since Hillary <laughs> Clinton uh, claimed that she didn't have classified right. information on her email server. So uh, you've been calling balls and strikes. Is this a real step towards proving that President Trump was, tar then candidate Trump, was the subject of this really malicious targeting and putting out this false narrative and being spied on? Well, I, I think, it, yes. I mean, I think the, the basics are, are kind of already out there. That's kind of what's strange about this story is, um, you know, Durham is essentially already found and it's already been established that there really was no predicate uh, legitimate predicate for the, the initial kind of Russia collusion stories. And now what Durham is doing is digging the specifics of who were the people that fed this kind of information into the hopper at the government, what was their motivation, and why were they doing it? Mm. I mean, for, for Hillary Clinton, uh, I, I don't have particular patience to see her criticizing this because she was hyping this Russian Alpha Bank thing on Twitter, you know, the day after the story came out. And so, I mean, it looks an awful lot like a, a political hit in that you have the candidate ready to go with the uh, Trump-Russia connection soon after this, this, um, you know, this information was dumped yeah. into the government and there was a story about the investigation. Well, and also, and so also, I think that this is clearly politically motivated. The question is just how bad the conduct was to get that stuff into the government. You know, and it's a great point that you make there also because uh, if indeed Hillary Clinton was sort of talking to Sussman about this, the lawyer that was connected, and he was telling the FBI, oh, no, I have nothing to do with politics. That, that just sort of makes it all the more political. Uh, Bob, we knew you were the right mm -hmm. guy to talk about this. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Coming up, parents revolt against a progressive school board in one of the most progressive cities in America. Those parents are here. Plus, some outrage after Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau's crackdown on protesters. How is it that the Canadian Civil Liberties Union is after the most liberal prime minister in Canada? Welcome back. A Democrat on Democrat war in San Francisco ended yesterday with the most woke being thrown out and looking towards November. It's a major slap in the face to those who believe the progressive end of the Democratic Party is its future. A majority of voters in the deep blue city of San Francisco recalled three members of the city's school board who were putting social justice ahead of in-person learning. Parents launched the recall early last year amid their frustration over schools staying remote while the board moved forward with other things on their agenda, like renaming 44 schools, including ones that honored Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, and Democrat Senator Dianne Feinstein over alleged associations with racism, slaveholding, or oppression. The board backed down. This is the first such recall of school board members in San Francisco's history. The Democratic mayor there, London Breed, also backed the effort and will now appoint three new members before November's election. But opponents say the recall was a power grab with funding from millionaires and billionaires looking to privatize, in their words, the public schools. With us now, Sivaraj and Autumn Loyan. I knew I was going to get that right. Who launched the recall effort in San Francisco. Nice to see you both. All right, so Siva and Autumn, are you guys just uh, billionaires who want to privatize schools? Or <laughs> was there something else going on here? Well, you know, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> We haven't, you know, we haven't been earning anything for the last year for sure. So yes, I, I think so. This recall effort was really nothing but parents generally upset with the school board's lack of priority and lack of focus on reopening our schools at a time when our kids desperately needed to be back. And so, and that's how it started. And it seems to have catalyzed the entire city into saying, "Hey, this is this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable." 
to set back the most disadvantaged kids, who are actually the ones who have fallen furthest behind in this pandemic. Um, and it's not acceptable for the school board members to be so focused on issues that are not priority for the students and for family. Mm. Autumn, it's tough to fight City Hall and win. You all did fight the school board and win. Why do you think these people were so focused on, as Siva pointed out, anything but what they were supposed to be focused on, which is the kids? I think they just had, um, I think I think they were very competent at listening to their constituents and figuring out what parents needed and what children needed. I mean, their job is to put students first, but again and again, we saw them trying to put their political careers first. I mean, most of San Francisco is in favor of renaming schools, but not when the house is on fire. Yeah, when, that, when the house is on fire, you got to put the fire out first. We're looking at video of some of the angry school boards that have happened across the country because it happened in Virginia, it's happened uh, in Missouri, it's happened in Colorado, almost every, every state. Um, I'm thinking, Autumn, uh, about this. Um, re previous recalls in San Francisco, 2001, 86% of San Francisco voted no on Gavin Newsom, 80% no on Gary Davis, 82% no on Dianne Feinstein, and in San Francisco, ranging from 73 to 79%, yes, to recall the three members of the school board. Is this political, you think, or is it beyond politics at this point? I think it's beyond politics. Right. It's interesting, when we started this, people said it was impossible. They said recall campaigns were very divisive. And yet we have managed to unify this city behind really basic things, good governance, making sure kids can read, um, you know, every child, every parent wants their child to succeed. Every parent wants their child to get a good education. Do, do you think, have you noticed, have you noticed a change in, now that you guys are so deeply involved in, in politics, have you noticed a change in the politicians since seeing the anger that has come out of this? I think there's a genuine, um, I think, especially amongst some of the elected leaders in San Francisco, I don't think this is still true for everyone in the city, but certainly many have you know, acknowledge the level of grassroots energy behind this, acknowledge that kids have fallen so far behind, acknowledge that the school board members have actually not paid attention to the, uh, to the you know, to the nitty gritty of running a job, right? And focusing on getting that done. And so they have responded and rallied to support this um, effort. Um, in a way, you know, we had 50% of the democratic clubs in San Francisco, the vast majority of them support endorse the recall of one or more members. Hmm. Wow. And that is, that is really, and so for something that was a grassroots effort initially to get s strong support from many members of the establishment, I would think is unprecedented. Especially since many of them originally supported these school board members exactly. in the first place. Well, so, th so they listened. They understood where their constituency was and these school board members did not. Autumn, last question. What would be your advice to parents who are facing some of the same feelings and issues that the school board isn't listening to them that you'd have for parents around the country? Boy, I would say that first try if we should try everything except a recall first because it will take over your life for a year. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, you know, as a last ditch effort, sometimes it works. Yeah, wow. I think if you don't speak up, you will not be heard. Well, uh, that is well said, and that actually is a perfect segue into our next segment. Uh, Siva, Autumn, uh, your kids are lucky to have both of you. Uh, looking out for them, as are the kids of San Francisco, because uh, you let your life be taken over for a year in order to focus on on them. And uh, I, I know there's a lot of folks very grateful for that. It's good to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks yeah. for having us. Thank you. Canada's crackdown on civil rights reached a new level today as the prime minister brought the full force of his new emergency powers to bear. Police in Ottawa warned truckers they would be arrested if they do not leave the city arrested for protesting. The truckers are there protesting vaccine mandates, have been for weeks. The prime minister doesn't like that much and has called them a bunch of racist and Nazis, then effectively took over Canada like a tyrant. This is the prime minister taking over like a tyrant. Here's what the truckers are saying about forms the police are handing out threatening arrest. They handed us this letter that says it's a notice from the police to leave. Well, this is what we did with it. Mic up. Oh, there you go. The truckers faced a government now using tactics more like the Banana Republic than a democracy. Remember, the protests are entirely peaceful. They have been for weeks. And the government, the prime minister, admits that his anger is focused on the protesters' views rather than actions. Here's one of the prime minister's cronies. 
Canadian Civil Liberties and joins us now. Am I right to feel like democracy in Canada ended over the weekend? Well, I can tell you that we're very concerned about the invocation of the Emergencies Act. Um, and at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, we firmly believe that dissent and protest is an absolutely essential part of a vibrant democracy. So we are concerned about the use of the Emergencies Act and extraordinary measures uh, to respond to protest movements across Canada. And we think it sets a really troubling precedent, absolutely. When you say the Emergencies Act, this is akin to sort of war powers, right? As I understand it, the prime, Min the prime minister is now king. There is no checks on him being able to arrest anybody or do anything. Well, not not quite. It's interesting because the Emergencies Act, I'm going to put my law nerd hat on, uh, was introduced in 1988. It was a successor to a piece of legislation called the War Measures Act. But if you look at the text of, of the Emergencies Act, it's quite different in nature. It's meant to deal with emergencies, which can include public order emergencies or public welfare emergencies. But they have to be emergencies that are of a national scale and that can't be dealt with under the existing laws of Canada. And that's where at the Civil Liberties Association, we feel that the threshold hasn't been met, uh, that the existing laws and procedures that we have in Canada are sufficient to deal with protests. And in fact, over the past few weeks, we've seen municipal, local police forces dealing with aspects of this protest movement in ways that used the existing legal framework. So in our view, pulling this trigger and using the Emergencies Act is not proportionate and isn't justified under the very terms of the act itself. Justin Trudeau is about as progressive of a leader as your country has ever had, probably, except maybe his father. Um, but why do you think that these protests are so threatening to him? You know, I think that protests, disruptive protests, can be a real challenge for governments all over the ideological spectrum. At the Civil Liberties Association, we are not an ideological or partisan or political organization. I don't think this is a right wing or a left wing issue. Um, I think that when protests are disruptive and have economic consequences, uh, often governments sometimes and police forces want to respond in a heavy handed way. And as an organization, we take the position that no matter what the protest is about, um, and no matter where on the political or ideological spectrum the protesters lie, uh, that it's really important that we respect freedom of peaceful assembly, that we respect freedom of expression, and we find ways as a society to let people use public space to have their voices heard. Um, and that's a really fundamental value in a democracy. It, it certainly is. Uh, I won't make you comment on this. It's, it's clear that Mr. Trudeau's uh, response to certain ideological protests have been different than to other ideological protests. Um, is, do you guys have any recourse here? Because once he invokes the Emergencies Act and says, I don't like these people's views, are they facing the kinds of things of life ruining consequences that the, I guess it was the premier of Ottawa talked about? The premier of Ontario, Premier Ford. Uh, well, absolutely. We took a look at the orders that were published today uh, in the Canada Gazette and that were made available. And so these are the orders and the regulations under the Emergencies Act that the government is putting into place. Those orders prohibit uh, blocking critical infrastructure or blocking the movement of people and goods. So in our view, that's quite wide. The terms of the order aren't specifically tied to Ottawa. So they could apply to protest activities elsewhere in Canada. And yes, violating those orders um, can lead to criminal charges and can lead to a fine up to $5,000 uh, and or imprisonment. So there now, are absolutely you know, it's, potential it's, it's criminal stunning. consequences. Yeah, no, it really, it really is stunning. Hey, we really appreciate your time and your work on this. Thank you. And uh, as the cases happen, we'll talk to you about it. Laura, good to see you. All right. Thank you. Kiss your guacamole goodbye. The great guacamole and avocado war is next.
Somehow, the president of Mexico and President Biden are at war over avocados, and your guacamole is caught in the middle. Avocados are already in short supply. Prices of the fruit have doubled since last month. Andres Manuel Lopez Orbador accused the United States of making false reports that an American health inspector was threatened by the avocado cartels in Mexico. President Biden banned imports of Mexican avocados in response to the alleged threat. Arbador, the president of Mexico, claims it's all part of a plan to help American avocado farmers beat their competitors in Mexico. Eight of 10 avocados purchased in the U.S. come from a specific region in Mexico. Many of the producers say they won't be able to fill the void here in the United States. Ben Holtz is a California avocado farmer. I guess in a weird way, Ben, this is good for you, right? Because now your fruit's worth a lot more. No, not necessarily. It's it's kind of a bad situation because we want a stable market for the consumers and the grocery stores. Wow. So how how long before avocados become like tulips? Well, uh, so right now there's about a three week supply of avocados in the pipeline feeding the network in the United States. And so depending on how long this hold lasts, then we'll see how much uh, impact it'll have on the supply in the U.S. 80 percent come from Mexico. Are we already starting to see hoarding and you getting calls from people trying to pre-buy avocados? No, not really. The market's, uh, you know, seen a little bit of uh, volatility in the last couple of days. But uh, late uh, this morning, there was a meeting of a lot of officials on both sides of the Mexico and U.S. And apparently a, a resolution has been uh, unofficially uh, reached. And uh, now it's just a matter of uh, having a, a safe return to the inspectors that uh, certify the fruit coming up north. Wow. So we have a ceasefire in the avocado war. Uh, so can we, can we all now go and have as much guacamole as we want? We shouldn't worry about this? Oh, absolutely. Always have a lot oh, of guacamole. Yes. <laughs> we, we've got a lot of fruit available. You know, I, I sell on the Internet all over the country, but uh, all of the grocery stores are fully stocked, and all of the, the produce and avocados will keep on, on the shelves. There should not be any empty shelves anytime soon. Th this, this brings up a larger issue, right? 80% of the avocados come from Mexico, a huge percentage of those are controlled by the drug cartels who also do everything else in Mexico. Uh, does that translate ever into threats to you and your group in the United States? You know, um, I don't necessarily uh, understand the control that the, the, the cartel directly has down there. I know there's various organizations um, that uh, are involved in the processing and um, packing of avocados to get up north. Uh, this particular issue, I've been told uh, through my network of sources, uh, was not related at all to the cartels, that it was a, a safety threat on a USDA inspector official who was certifying truckloads that were heading north, making sure they comply with all the laws and standards and uh, uh, phytosanitary concerns that we have up here. And so uh, what uh, my understanding is, is that the conversation got to a very serious escalated level uh, and threats were made on the lives of one or multiple inspectors. And so they said, hey, you guys, we need to come to a, a, an agreement on some new adjustments, new changes and new safety measures because we don't want anybody losing their life over these. Well, um, if the avocado wars continue, uh we're going to have to have you back because your sources were wrong. And if we all have guacamole for the rest of our lives, we have you to thank. Ben, it was good to see you. Thank you, my friend. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was good to see you. This is great. All right. Your kids or grandkids can't stop using TikTok. We'll tell you why the Chinese, the communists in Beijing, might be really happy about that. TikTok is owned by the Beijing-based company ByteDance. Of course, all Chinese businesses are essentially an extension of the Chinese government and their intelligence services. President Trump even tried to block the app over those concerns. India actually did. But Apple and Google assured us it would be safe for American users. But The Wrap, an online tech publication, reports Beijing has a way around. TikTok can circumvent security protections on Apple and Google app stores and uses device tracking that gives TikTok's Beijing-based parent full access to user data. Paul Sems, Managing Director of Remediation Services at Trusted Sec, joins us now. So if Hi, I have nice. TikTok on my phone and the Chinese want to know what's on my phone, 
it makes it a lot easier for the Chinese to do that. Well, yeah. So what that report is indicating is that uh, the way that they've developed their software makes it uh, be able to change dynamically. And the difference between other applications and this is that other applications typically go through an approval process with Apple and Google on the Android platform where they review the source code, they understand where that data is going, the ins and outs. And what's revealed in the report is that they have the ability to dynamically change that code. And so they can push down updates without really any user intervention, allowing potential data to leak uh, without uh, regards to the, the individual's privacy. So essentially, if China wants to know what's on your phone, they put a new TikTok app on you, a new upgrade to TikTok on your phone, and now they have control of your phone. Is, it, is, is this as scary as it seems? Well, the, the I mean, how, let me ask it a different way. Is, this isn't yeah. a coincidence that they're the only people doing this. Well, all, all of the social media apps do this. I mean, you are their product, right? So it's a free app, uh, Facebook, all of the other uh, social media apps do this. I think the big difference we're seeing here is the transparency of the data that they're collecting and that the fact that you don't really have control to be able to delete it as quickly as you would on other platforms. So for example, the California Consumer Privacy Act, they have, they're required, TikTok is required to report that. They, they only reported back in 2020 for the entire year, uh, 490 requests to delete information. With those billions of users or even 80 million users in the United States, I'm really surprised that they only processed 490 requests to delete information. Um, on other platforms such as Facebook, uh, you can go into the app itself and you can actually see all of the data that's collected in real time you can see all of the location information and all the other metadata that's been collected on you. And you also have the ability to delete that. Um, we don't see that level of transparency with this particular app. Um, it's kind of uh, you know, unreasonable to think with billions of users that there was only 490 some requests to uh, delete The idea data. that they can dynamically update, update it and therefore get around all of these protections, if you're not doing something wrong or want to do something nefarious, there's no reason to build that in, is there? Not really, um, because you can push those out through the normal change management process. So the normal process would be just like you get those app updates. They just happen, right? They go through the code scanning process. They scan the code. It goes through there. So there really isn't a compelling reason to have it done that way. Um, it's a unique feature from the report um, that was uh, that I, I was able why, to. Why, are, why would up. Apple and Google allow a program that goes around all of their security protections? Yeah, so I think what their idea is that um, the argument back or the, what they're pushing back, number one, it's a big app and it, it, it makes probably a lot of, they're collecting data on that also and selling that data. So I think that's you know uh, in an interesting situation, right? So, hey, we have this app that is getting people to buy our products and we can not only do that, but we can also you know have the end users engaged on it. So that's data that we can sell. So, you know, it's kind of counterproductive for them to shut down one of the biggest apps. Um, they have done it, but in, for other things. But um, I think they're, they're sneaking by. So that, that's what this report is that just came out is, is saying is, hey, there's enough here that it needs, needs to be investigated. And I think that's probably what's going to be one of the results of this. Now, you have to also wonder, though, how much the Chinese have been able to glean off of things uh, up until they, they figured this out. Wow. Uh, scary, fascinating, and I just deleted TikTok. So, Paul, thank you very yes. much. We'll be right back. <laughs> Typically, when things go wrong, you learn from them. At least, that's the idea. So, let's consider all the things that have gone wrong with the Olympics, or I should say, going wrong. There are four more days for it to get worse. So, let's review where we're at. First, there's still no snow, and rather than beauty shots of mountains, we get to look at a ski jump built in the middle of an industrial wasteland. Most of the Chinese hockey team is Americans and Canadians who think it's cool to play the jersey wearing of a country that is committing the worst genocide since World War II. I say, quote, cool, because that's actually what they say about playing for China. This is the country they think is cool to play for. We're going to keep showing you this side-by-side -side picture every night of the Olympics because NBC will not. Minorities in China, head shaved and shackled, lined up waiting for a train to a concentration camp is on your left. This is happening in China every day. This is who those Americans are playing for, the country that does what is on the left. 
On the right is Nazi Germany lining up Jews heading to the gas chamber. There's no difference. Let's not forget the International Olympic Committee gave the games to the Chinese, passing up Norway, where there is snow and there is not genocide. As we predicted, the games themselves would be anything but fair. A Russian figure skater tested positive for drugs, but then claimed that she mixed up her grandfather's heart medication. And in a bizarre turn of events, the anti-doping board cleared her to compete. Viewers are voting with their eyeballs. The ratings are terrible. Does anybody other than the Chinese and Russians want something this bad repeated? We can conclude the International Olympic Committee might. They are feckless, corrupt, and incompetent. Which brings us to our social media question. What can we learn from the embarrassment that is Beijing 2022? What will it take for the IOC to learn its lesson? Let us know on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Leland Vittard. Don't worry about talking to us on TikTok. The Chinese already know what you say and do there. Big surprise, the Russians were lying. They're putting more troops on the border ready to invade Ukraine. We'll look at that tomorrow night. Here's Dan. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.